Good morning, Ryan. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. We're really excited about the topics for today, really all tied together around keeping your team focused, engaged, and improving, making strategic management as easy as possible for your team. So um, as true to form, we'll start our um, topic today with a stat of the month, a strategy stat of the month, and then we'll go into the, the three different components of, of, of keeping your team focused, engaged, and improving. So Tommy, I'll talk us through the focus. Piece. Uh, I'll talk you through keeping everyone engaged, and uh, then Elsa will be speaking about driving continuous improvement. And then, as always, um, at the end, we will take questions and answers, um, tapping into the wisdom of the crowd, as we like to say. So please uh, feel free to raise your hand and or pop your question into the chat box on the bottom uh, right-hand side. So with that, let's jump into the strategy stat of the month. I particularly liked this one that I saw a couple of weeks ago that in, it is somewhat uh, relevant to us and I was I was thinking that it was most appropriate when the title came across it it said why do you always sit in the same place in meetings and it seems like you know oftentimes um, that's what happens with people so according to this particular study it was based on students um, only use about 2.5 percent of the total lecture hall space uh, that's available in classrooms and sort of a similar type of uh, type of use of space in meetings as well, apparently. So why do people always sit in the same place? Because I guess uh, the reason, according to this study, is we exhibit territorial behavior, and we don't want to have to renegotiate seating arrangements. So that might be a little bit more psychology than we need this morning, but uh, certainly kind of a fun strategy stat that you'll, it'll get you a good chuckle when you uh, think about who takes what seats at the next meeting. So with that um, little bit of backdrop, let's jump on into uh, thinking about keeping our team focused. Uh, and I'd like to turn the talk over to Tommy. Tommy, take us through getting focused. Thank you, Erica. First of all, I would like to, to thank everyone at M3 Planning for the resources they have provided to me over the last two and a half to three years. The individuals within the organization have been very informative, very helpful, and the MyStrategicPlan.com website has been a very useful tool and, and, and in my mind is actually a strategic planning university. Currently, I'm working with 15 organizations in a strategic management role, either on a weekly, a monthly, or a quarterly basis utilizing MyStrategicPlan.com as the strategic management tool. Now, the common theme with all these organizations was a lack of unified focus. This became evident in the pre-planning stage through answers to pre-planning questions. It later became more obvious in the planning session itself. The evidence was that the mission or the purpose statement of the organization was not clear or unknown and as a result, the values, the vision, the goals of the organization were equally as unclear. Everyone in the planning session understood their title. They, they understood their role within the organization and even the current goals or targets for their department, their division, or their own individual goals. However, what was not clear was how their role and their goals fit within the overall mission of the organization. Now, in some cases, the organizations were struggling financially, but in some cases, the organizations were financially fit. But in all cases, two items were evident. First of all, a lack of a laser focus for the organization. And as a result, number two, lack of clear communication of the focus for the organization. So the goal that I have set for myself in working for organizations I provide strategic management services to is to quote unquote, get focused. So to demonstrate today, I have a few slides that I'm still in the process of developing to accomplish two things. First of all, for me to become laser focused upon the services I provide. I feel like it's important for me to demonstrate that I'm indeed very focused and second, to demonstrate what getting focus looks like within an organization that I can communicate in a very brief conversation or display in a PowerPoint presentation. Now, today we're going to spend a few minutes reviewing the following slides, but personally I have a goal to explain these slides to someone 
within one minute. And ultimately, this becomes a goal for the leaders of the organizations to share the focus of their organization in a very clear and concise manner within a similar time frame. So the theme of all of these slides is the word focus, and I've made an attempt to display a mission statement, values, vision, competitive advantage, uh, all from the perspective of using the word focus as an acronym to do this. So the first slide I'd like to, to show you is focus as a mission statement. Now the mission statement of the organization that, that I currently have is to facilitate the clarification and implementation of purpose, focus, and direction through a strategic planning process. But to make this fit within the word focus, you can see that I have revised this to some degree to state focus as a mission statement is to facilitate the organization of, the clarification of, and the unification of strategic management or strategy. Be crystal clear what the who and the what and the how questions are when answering a mission statement. Focus as a value statement. Values drive an organization that provides, you might say, some parameters with, within they will, in, in which they carry out their mission or their purpose of, of the organization. The focus as a value statement for me becomes, first of all, just being faithful to what I said I would do, be dependable, to be a person of integrity to be organized, very organized, very structured. Unfortunately, we have a tool through MyStrategicPlan.com that provides an excellent framework for this to occur. Communication, clear, concise communication of what the mission, the purpose, the vision, the values of the organization is. Understanding. There are times you have to listen and listen well and be patient, and be understanding. And finally, simplicity. Taking what appears to be complex or a wealth of information and then being able to provide it in a simplistic format that can be understood, that's clear, and is relative and, and motivates an individual within an organization to be excited about the purpose of an organization. Next, focus as a unique or competitive advantage. When strategic planning, we always talk about what do you do best? What is the one area within your organization that you can do or will do better than any other organization within your industry? So I would describe focus or the, the, the competitive advantage using the acronym FOCUS is to first of all provide framework provide pre-planning questions, provide planning sessions, and then the tools such as MyStrategicPlan.com. For organizations, this can be companies, it can actually be events, it can be projects, it can be any type of organization that needs some framework and needs some structure. Next, to clarify or to communicate, be very clear and concise and, and the communication effort of the, the mission and the vision and the values of the organization. And then next, for the organization, the, the leadership and all of those associated with the organization to understand what it is they're in business to do so that they become unified in this effort and, and become excited about the fact that they're with an organization that's very clear about who they are and what they desire to accomplish within the organization. And then finally, strategic management process. This en encompasses not only the pre-planning stage and the planning session, but the follow-up, implementation and follow-up, and keeping score of the progress that's being made. Next, focus as a vision statement. First of all, follow-up. In my work thus far with the organizations that um, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with, this is clear. This is one of the areas that most organizations 
or somewhat weakened, it's follow-up. There are goals that have been set. There are goals that have been, a, a date has been established, but oftentimes follow-up lacks. And my impression or my opinion of the reason follow-up is oftentimes lacking. I think it goes back to the mission statement. There's not a clear purpose. And so sometimes follow-up is just, it's missing. So um, what I hope to accomplish in the work that I do is to make it very clear how important and critical follow-up is. Next is to be open and organized in the communication process. You know, I've, I've mentioned communication several times. You know, one aspect of this that we haven't mentioned is to be open, to create an atmosphere of openness in communication, getting to what is oftentimes referred to as the ground truth and having an environment where the ground truth can be, can be communicated and dealt with. Next, clear mission, values, and vision statement. These need to be crystal clear, and I believe it's my role as a, in, in the strategic management process to be certain that each of these are clear. Next, another important aspect of moving forward in an organization is that there be a unified culture in the pursuit of the vision. Be clear on the vision, but, but as best you can, be sure that there's, there's unity within the organization and moving forward towards this, this vision that has been set. And then finally, the S for scorecards or measuring performance. Once the goals have been set that move the organization towards the vision to be, a, to, to be pursued, be certain that along the way, all the measurements are being, are being set, but also are being scored and that they're being measured. Constant measurement is, is, is important as the vision is being pursued. So the goal that I have within the, in the organization that I'm working with now is to have 50 what I will call focused organizations in five years practicing focus. Clear mission statement, clear values, clear the, uh, about the competitive or unique advantage, clear in the vision, and then all of this within a framework using MyStrategicPlan.com or even some other tool that is very useful in, in moving forward in this process. Tommy, I have a question for you before sure. we move on. Is um, you know, one of the clients that we're working with right now is struggling with the idea around communication um, and confidentiality. So obviously, in a competitive situation when we're working with uh, private companies, we're always balancing the need to keep things confidential because we don't want our competitors to know, and then also the need for open and, and being transparent and certainly you can't execute what you can't, what you don't know about, right? So what have you advised your clients around balancing those two competing, you know, problems? Within the organization? Yeah, yeah. Or, or have you run across that, you know, that, that challenge? Uh, the confidentiality challenge, um, Erica, has not been as much of an issue as, I would say, communication of, of what the mission and the values and the vision of the organization is. Um, so I, I can't say that I really had to deal with that um, often, or I can't, I can't even recall at this point where that's been an issue. I think that within the software, MyStrategicPlan.com software, certainly there are, there are ways to keep information confidential if that becomes an issue. But I really haven't seen that to, to be an issue thus far. Interesting. Okay. And maybe some of our participants might have run into that as well, so I, just was, I was just curious. So that's great. Yeah, and you're right. We, 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 in the application, we can certainly turn things, turn things on and off. So. Thanks, and I and I know you were going to talk to us about about focus results as well. Yeah. So the next slide, results of focus. So what what I hope to occur as a result of this process is number one, 
to be fearless and faithful in the pursuit of the vision. Fearless meaning leaders within the organization, team leaders within the organization, being so crystal clear of what the vision is and what their role is in the pursuit of the vision is just gives them a sense of freedom that we know where we're headed and we know what we've got to do to get there. So there it creates a sense of, you might say, guarded fearlessness, but nonetheless fearlessness and to be faithful in the pursuit. Next, to, to be open in the communication and opportunistic in the pursuit. Uh, once, I think, once the goal and the vision is clear, um, there are opportunities that come along the way that I've found in organizations that they've never thought of before, but have, but have not felt open to present those opportunities. But the goal would be to create a culture that allows this to happen. Next, to be concise and clear in the pursuit. Never become so complex that goals are difficult to understand. Understand and, and unified in the pursuit, uh, I think as a result of being clear and concise, being open in the communication, being fearless in the pursuit, the leaders and those who are involved in an organization in the pursuit of the vision, once they understand it, they become unified. And then finally, keep score. Keep score, we just need, the organization just needs to know year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, whatever the time frame is, how are we doing? What's working? What's not working? And the results of becoming focused can then move, I believe, an organization towards a vision that um, is, is they will be much more successful in attaining once the mission, the values, the competitive advantage, and the vision is crystal clear and there's framework within the organization uh, to keep score. Summary and takeaways. Continuing with this acronym of, of FOCUS, frame it. By frame it, I, I simply mean create structure. Whether it's mystrategicplan.com or some other tool, Create structure. Second, organize the effort. Stay organized throughout the process of accomplishing a, a vision. Communicate. Communicate consistently. Communicate clearly and concisely. Unify the team. Keep the team informed. And I believe oftentimes this creates unity. And then finally, again, to just to, to reiterate the importance of scoring, analyzing, update. And then once you or, or making progress, celebrate the progress along the way. So that an organization is not only focused and they're not only accomplishing their goals, but it's fun. It's enjoyable to be a part of an organization that is clearly focused and they celebrate progress along the way. Tommy, I love the, the thinking around around focus. I just have a quick question for you based on your experience. What what if, of what should we do um, as in our organizations to take kind of the first step in 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 applying focus? Where would you start? Within any organization? Yeah, within any organization. So you, you kind of went through the mission and vision and values and all that. But if if I was to you know start working on that next week, where would you where would you start the trail? I would start the trail with the mission or the purpose statement. Okay. In my in my planning sessions, the mission statement in in these 15 companies, a couple of things have happened. Number one, the mission statement. Not only was it changed, but it became um, within I would say most of them were within 15 words or less. Okay. Most of them, in fact, are probably between eight to ten words. What happens is. It takes about an average of two to three hours um, to, to accomplish that effort. Sometimes it's taken longer, sometimes less. But that mission statement, be crystal clear who you are, what you're doing, and how you are doing whatever it is your, your focus is, to be crystal clear on what that is. That, to me, is the foundation from which the rest of the plan is built. Yeah. 
And I just love that because I think it's so, uh, sometimes we think the mission, vision, value stuff is a little bit overdone and trite and it gets played up too much on websites and all that. And, and uh, to your point, it is just, you know, pushing all of that aside, we always talk about how critical those components are to an effective strategy and an effective direction. So just really, really appreciate the refresher on that and, 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 and keeping that front of mind uh, for everybody. And I think it's a great segue as well as we move into the topic of engaging the organization um, because it's pretty hard to keep the organization engaged month after month if you don't have a really solid articulated mission statement as Tommy just went through and, and that really clear vision direction. And I think a lot of times what happens with that, um, and I just really like that point about being ruthless in the pursuit of your, of your vision um, and persistent because I think sometimes it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to falter on that. It's also pretty hard to pick that place that we're trying to go sometimes too. So it does take that courage. Um, as Tommy mentioned. So, so let's talk about engaging um, the organization month after month. So sometimes the strategic planning process um, can drag on, um, and sometimes we move through the planning process fairly quickly, and of course we're into man management and execution, and, and how do we pe keep people engaged and, um, and inspired? So let's, let's look at some tips related to, to this. And I just thought there were five key takeaways in this area as you're driving forward the strategic management process. Um, these are things to keep in mind. A compelling vision. So, you know, Tommy certainly just went through that. Uh, the plan and the components of the plan need to be relevant to everyone. Uh, we need to hold staff able, uh, accountable, yes, and able as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Measures that matter, uh, and it needs to drive decisions. So I think, you know, if you kind of keep those checkpoints in your mind, um, that will help keep people engaged when it feels like, um, like the flywheel is not turning, as I, as I like to say. So, so let's go through these uh, point by point. Having a compelling vision, of course, is sometimes uh, easier said than done. And we're just going to go to the, the next slide for a quick example on that. This is just a, a, an example of the state, at the Missouri State Health Department, Health, health and, health and uh, Social Services, excuse me, and, and uh, Elsa and myself had the opportunity to do a presentation out there last week and wanted to kind of just use their vision statement. I know it's a little hard to see there, but the compelling vision for their organization is Healthy Missourians for Life. And I think that's a really a great compelling vision statement. I'm certainly um, a lot more around that. It's short, it's sweet, and, and definitely the organization is engaged around, around making that happen. Um, I could, we kind of talked about the fact that vision can, um, can be a hopeful statement and we can hope that we're going to get there or we can, as a second choice, ensure that we actually achieve that vision. And a strategic management process is really all about making that vision um, become a reality and not just having words on a piece of paper. So, so just, a, just an idea of making sure that your vision is compelling and how you communicate that effectively and consistently uh, time after time is a key point to keeping people engaged. Making sure the plan is relevant to everyone. So we accomplish making the plan relevant to everyone by cascading objectives and goals, whatever words you're using. So I, I think that sometimes the mechanics of planning can overshadow the purpose of why we do different things. So of course the My Strategic Plan system is really built on cascading and the reason that we built it on cascading is because at the end of the day we need to see relevance I as an individual contributor need to see relevance of my work to the bigger picture and I also have to understand and feel capable of accomplishing the goals and objectives that have been assigned to me so a couple tips on the sticky note there about keeping it relevant to everyone is it's an action statement so we understand what we're supposed to do. I just really think that's a, such an important thing. What are we really driving? And we'll talk about that in, in a minute about measures that matter. Um, that the items that have been assigned to me or that I've signed up for, that I'm the right person to make that happen. And then the other, the other little point there is the right rock size or the right grain size. So I always like to think about um, the, the, the cascading of goals and objectives and, you know, strategic, uh, long-term strategic goals are, are big rocks, if you will, a department objective. So the next level down might be, uh, might be boulders. 
um, the division objectives might be uh, stones and the team member objectives might be pebbles or whatever. And what's important about that is not to mix up the sizes because when I'm looking at what I am responsible for contributing to, I need to make sure that I actually have the authority uh, to act on the items that I've been assigned or that I've signed up for. So relevance to everyone, that's such an important piece that, uh, to keeping people engaged. The next item is the whole concept of holding staff accountable, or maybe a little spin on that is, is holding people able. And I, that's, a, that's a, a little riff uh, from Susan Scott, who is the author of Fierce Conversations. So I give her all the credit for, for that little twist on accountability. And what I think the powerful point of that is, is you know, accountability is a carrot and stick you know, thinking. Um, holding people able is, is empowering and communicating confidence in skills and capabilities of our team. And we're well aware of the fact that not everybody has every skill and capability that we need to execute, including ourselves. But the idea of, um, you know, starting with the best in mind, putting training um, and coaching and mentoring where it needs to be in order to, um, in order to help people accomplish what they're responsible for is really kind of a twist, again, on accountability and holding staff able. So just think about that um, as just a, th a thought on, keeping people engaged because when people feel, um, and we all know this, when we're, we get demotivated when we feel like it's a whip. We get um, inspired and energized when we feel like we're empowered to do things and we're excited about them. And that's a, that's a, a very important mental model to keep in mind as, as strategists and, and as folks that are responsible for driving execution. So my other little sticky note there as well is just that idea that in order for someone to be held able, they need to be inspired. Inspired, it needs to be clear and no ambiguity. So just, just think about, uh, about those things. The picture that's on the screen is an example of one of our action sheets from my strategic plan, and, and that just gives you a visual representation of what we're holding Tim, our example on here, able to accomplish. So holding staff able. The next item is measures that matter. So this is a, there's a lot going on on this slide, and I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I... I want to touch on a couple key concepts here, and this is just something that we have been coming back to a lot lately in our work, and it's the difference between output measures and outcome measures. So having outcome measures helps people stay engaged because we're driving towards some sort of purpose, if you will, or some sort of greater um, yeah, so a greater outcome as opposed to just an output. So here's an example. There's a goal that's on here. And you know, these are medical, uh, these are medical goals. So for those of us that aren't super versed in that industry, and myself included, I'll, I'll try not to screw this up too much. But in the customer area on the left-hand side, you can see that the the big goal there is to increase participation in the Stanford chronic self uh, chronic disease self management model. Okay, and we're looking to increase participation from some point right now, which it says XX to 800 by 2013. Okay, well. An example of a measure to so making that smart um, would be the number of participants, number of participants in in the in the program because you know we're trying to increase participation. Okay, fine. Well, you know, as we kind of thought about it a little bit more, actually, the outcome that we're seeking is not really just more people in the program. What we're really seeking to accomplish is to drive improvement in self-management of those folks that have chronic disease. So one of the suggestions that was made by, by the workshop that we were in facilitating this was, um, and I think I have this right, that, the, that we know uh, that an outcome that we're seeking, we know when people who are managing, self-managing chronic disease actually have uh, managed to lower their, their blood pressure. So that's a bit of a leading indicator to actually improving people's health and therefore the, the self-management of the, of the chronic disease is actually improving. So that's more important than just the number of people that are in the program. So that's just kind of a different way to think about, um, think about outcome measures as opposed to output measures. So let's flow down this, this strategy map a little bit further. So we know from working with strategy maps that we try to put together cause and effect relationships. So we don't just want to put numbers on a piece of paper just because they're, they're numbers. How are we actually going to make these improvements happen? 
Well, in the internal area, uh, one of the, well, uh, sorry, back on the customer area, first, certainly people need to know about uh, the model and, 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 and learn about how to self-manage their chronic diseases. So the improved communication is certainly is a leading indicator to helping, um, you know, helping these folks um, understand uh, what's available to them to help manage their, manage their chronic disease. We, in the process area, need to put processes in place that help us increase the early detection. So that's, those are evidence-based strategies. Those are internal process improvements that are driven by the people at the Department of Health. And, and an example here of an output measure would be the increase in cases where diseases are detected early compared to last year. That's a good example of what we're actually really trying to see change as a result of that improved process. So that process improves, um, and if we improve that process, and we, as well as if we communicate more effectively to those that have chronic diseases, we will hopefully see the improved, um, the improvement in their self-management of their chronic diseases. So that there's a little bit of our cause and effect. Down in the people area, if we're asking people to use evidence-based strategies, they need training on it. So that's where the people piece is, is related to. An example there, of course, is, is we're looking for behavior change. So one way, an outcome measure there to, to manage and, and look to see whether we're actually seeing action based on the training is how is supervisors documenting improvement in performance evaluations. That's a, that's a good example of an outcome measure. What we would normally see there as a measure would be the number of people that attended the training. Again, not a bad measure, but not a very inspiring measure. So again, the switch between measures that matter are outcome based, not just output based. And then the last item on here is their financial piece, and that's around financial management. So, so a couple of things that are going on here that I, and I took a little extra time on this. A couple of things that are going on are number one, the idea of moving from from output measures to outcome measures, and the other idea is helping people see the cause and effect relationships between what it's going to take to drive improvement by linking things together and not just putting a number or a measure out there without the supporting actions, processes, training funding to make it happen. So measures that matter, really important to keeping uh, people engaged in the process and helping people see the dial move. Measures that change, measures that move, um, help people feel like we're getting those small wins, things are moving, things are improving, and, and that's really important as well. So the next item around pe keeping people in, oh, and here are some questions, excuse me, uh, to move from outcome um, measures, uh, from output measures. So really quickly, what is the result or the outcome of achieving the objective or the goal? Why are we working on this? How will we know when we have accomplished the objective and the goal? Um, and then I like that last one on there is, do our measures tell our story? So those are great questions, and, and uh, Ryan will be sharing these slides with you. You can use them in your back pocket when you're looking at creating measures, measures that matter, um, <clears throat> asking yourself um, these questions help make sure that we have compelling measures. And then driving decisions. So this is just another, this is an example of a calendar of strategy meetings and operational meetings. And the point I wanted to illustrate here is number one is we keep people engaged by talking about the goals and objectives and progress against our goals and objectives and how we're doing at accomplishing our vision. And that we don't just do it once a year because um, people are just going to hope it goes away. And most of the time it does. So by setting up a specific calendar where we actually make decisions, a calendar of meetings where we know we're visibly going to talk about our goals and objectives, and we're not, it's not going to be a whipping session because we're holding people able, not accountable, um, that makes people understand that this is not just a passing fad. So what's listed here, and this is just a good example of a matrix that you might um, put together for your organization, is um, uh, across the top are the type of meetings, weekly operational meetings, divisional strategy meetings, department strategy meetings, and then all hands meetings. And this model, the top is level is a department, and then underneath that is a division. So that's how that's kind of structured. So, you know, your org structure is probably a little different. So think about it that way. Down the left-hand side are the different people in the organization. Of course, the, the CEO or the department director, in this case, division manager, team leads, and then individual contributors. And so the point here in this, in this matrix is just to kind of see who needs to attend what meetings, when do they occur, and what do they need to bring to the meeting in order to facilitate a conversation that drives decisions. So really a simple and effective way to, to, to link all the meetings together and also provide visibility 
uh, into the process. So with that, here are your next steps. So how do we do this? Um, a couple of things, thinking about the fact that individual goals and actions are big rocks. They're the big rocks for those individuals. They're not just sequential task lists, so that's a really good way to demotivate people. Uh, making sure that you're actually articulating uh, strategic initiatives, not just business as usual, especially when you get down to the individual goal level. Review those measures and make sure that they're outcome-based. And make sure you've got those strategy sessions set and discuss um, you know, objectives, um, not just go around the room and have people rattle off their goals. So those are just some suggestions uh, around how you keep people engaged in some of your next steps. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Elsa, who's going to talk to us about how do we actually drive continuous improvement um, when we're really trying to move those numbers. And sometimes those, those numbers don't move. So what do we do, Elsa? Thank you, Erica. You know, Erica has touched on so many um, important elements of CQI, which is continuous improvement management. And uh, what I'm going to be t uh, talking to you about is how we take the initiatives of CQI and how we break it out and, and really utilize it with, uh, with your plan. So um, what is CQI? Again, uh, continu continuous quality uh, initiative or improvement. And uh, it is consistent of four basic elements. For the most part, if any of you and, and many of you might be very involved in CQI initiatives, um, there's always a problem that needs to be solved. And why are we solving the problem? First of all, we're trying to increase our efficiency. We're trying to, in many cases, um, many organizations implement CQI initiatives because they want to reduce costs. Ultimately, it is driving quality. And we want to focus on the mission, um, the core elements of, of your organization. We want to drive quality. And we want to reduce costs, but we want to ultimately end up with excellent outcomes, and that is driving quality throughout the organization. So first of all, we have to identify that problem. What are the problems that we are trying to solve? And if you are new to CQI, and if you are trying to use dual systems with CQI, you want to first start off slow and identify which problem are you going to start with and how are we going to solve that problem. CQI involves uh, interpersonal skills. It means getting everyone involved. CQI is going to be most uh, beneficial to your organization. You're going to improve the outcomes uh, if you involve every member in your team. It's going to demand teamwork. So when, and those go hand in hand, interpersonal skills, working with the team, uh, setting out uh, ground rules for the team, but again, encouraging and empowering the team so that they can participate and and drive the outcomes that you need. Quality improvement process, you are going to map out a process. CQI is all about process. It is all about measurement. Everything that Erica talked about, we're going to be touching again and wrapping it up with CQI. Typically, failure is not associated with individuals when you have uh, uh, CQI implemented. It's poor CQI process. That means that a lot of work has to go into the CQI initiative on the upfront mode so that you can have excellent outcomes. Um, secondly, focus must be critical of strategic development. So when I say that upfront mode, that means that you're going to have to really pay attention to workflow. You have to focus and, again, uh, have a clear, concise objective so that you can understand what it is that you're tackling and you know what you have to study in order to put your plan together. So let's go on and, and go through the next slide. First of all, um, and as I said, you have to develop a clear objective. What is it that I'm trying to accomplish? You have to make sure that it is concise and that it is measurable. When you have objective statements that are ambiguous, well, you're trying to tackle too many variables in one statement, then it is very difficult for the team to plan for, to evaluate, and ultimately to measure. So you're not quite sure what the outcome is supposed to be. You know, you know in the background that you would like to get this done, a particular thing uh, accomplished, but your statement isn't clear and concise. 
And so when, again, it, I, I live in Reno, and uh, there's mountains on the west side of Reno, and I can, I, I, geez, I can always find myself if I look for the mountains. Well, your staff has to have a very clear objective. They've got to be able to find what it is that they're trying to solve, and so if the objective statement is ambiguous, then it's very difficult for them to find themselves. Um, how will we know uh, that change is an improvement? Again, that goes back to a clear, concise objective and an objective that is measurable. So we're going to plan and we're going to uh, know what, what the outcome is that we're trying to achieve. We want to measure. So again, uh, Erica touched quite a bit on, on measurement. And uh, and it, it has to be a measurement that, that matters. What is the outcome that we're trying to achieve? And therefore, what is the best measurement that we can derive at that will help guide the team so that they know that when they're plotting, when they're putting in numbers, when they're evaluating their situation, they know exactly where they're, they are. And that's going to be all about measurement. What changes can we make that will result and improved outcome. So CQI is, is a, a consistent, it's, it's continuous quality improvement. It is uh, evaluating your situation, tweaking it a little bit, and attacking it again. I'm all about doing it right the first time. And this is what we spoke uh, about to the client last week when we spoke to them. Uh, we had an interesting and, and energetic speaker that spoke after us, and, and she said, you're going to hate CQI. You're going to hate doing what you're doing. You are uh, you are going to have to do it over and over, and you will make mistakes. Well, that is true with CQI. There will be a trial and error, but how much of it can you minimize? Because ultimately, that costs you money. So CQI is about cost containment, cost control. And so the more that you invest in the upfront planning, then your trial and error is minimized, and thereby reducing the cost of your organization. So, so you have to be able to, to define some uh, solid measurements that, that will guide you through the process. Okay, so begin by understanding the desired outcome, and I've just, I've just uh, covered that. What do we want to? What do we want to accomplish? So Erica's example was excellent. We, could, we can talk about numbers, but ultimately it was talking about the outcomes. Those individuals that wanted uh, that they wanted to uh, have helped themselves through uh, a self-management. These are people that will end up in the emergency room that will cost um, the state much more money if they do not understand how to self-manage their situation. So in that case, they had very clear, definitive outcomes. They wanted to improve the health of those individuals that were self-managing at home in order to reduce the cost, uh, the health care cost, to the state. And so you have to have a clear objective. Now, many of you in, uh, are, are working with the MSP uh, tool, the online MSP tool, and CQI may have some um, different nomenclature that you're using. Typically, a CQI works with initiatives. Uh, ultimately, you have to have an objective. So that's the, the one similarity is you do have an objective, and that can, just, a, a, I'm sorry, can translate. Then as far as key actions, what are the initiatives? What are those action items that you're going to have to perform in order to have the outcome that you want? So in MSP, what you're going to see is, is key actions. And so what are those key actions? And they are going to be assigned to the various members of your team. And then how are you going to measure them? What are the ultimate measurements? And again, these have to be, they have to have a purpose. Now again, in some cases, you're going to have to quantify them. What are the numbers? But in most cases, you are driving to a positive outcome. So make sure that your measures are meaningful. Then, Document and study. CQI is all about documentation. How did this work? What was the outcome? How are we going to have to slightly improve? If they had gone in with certain initiatives to train these individuals on how to self-manage their case situations, 
and, and it wasn't working initially, they were going to have to go in and revamp their initiatives a little bit. So CQI is all about documentation and evaluating your documentation before you move on and make uh, changes. So you want to make sure that the changes are also meaningful and that they will move you in the positive direction. Then ultimately you will have reports. The great thing about the MSP product is that it does provide you with some excellent reports that you can see on how you're doing as far as your performance. Now, lastly, with CQI, you will probably have some other uh, tools for reporting, and these are going to be tools that may be some very concise measuring goes on. All of those can be tied into the model. Ultimately, what you want to do is celebrate the achievement through the processes. Okay, so this will take us into uh, what the next steps are. Now again, empowering the people as you go through is a, is a critical component of CQI. Erica touched on it before I go into the next step. Erica touched on empowering your team. Keeping your team focused, keeping them moving the needle, a needle in the positive direction. And so she talked about pebbles and rocks and, and stones. CQI is, is uh, a program of many initiatives. Make sure that your team is empowered to perform the initiatives that they are that they have been assigned. So the important thing is, is you don't want to give one team member a rock if they're only empowered to do the pebble. So keeping that in mind, what are the next steps? First of all, pick a process or a problem. Obviously, in all organizations, we have processes and problems that really are cumbersome and they're costing us money. They're costing us uh, some inefficiencies, and, and again, mostly sometimes they're costing us people. So pick your problem and determine what the essential components of that problem is or are that you need to improve. So refine and revisit the objective you're trying to solve. Look at the problem, determine what the objective is that we're trying to solve, and define that objective as clearly and as precisely as possible. Identify what the favorable outcome is. Again, know where the mountains are. Know where the staff is driving. Make sure that the staff all knows what they're driving to. And again, ultimately, it is all about positive outcome. List your action items to improve the process. So we listed our ta action items to go through the process for improvement. And then we're going to study it, and we're going to revise it again. Look at it very critically. Do not make ch changes for the sake of changes. You know, uh, in reference to the speaker that I brought up, she says, you're going to make changes. You'll just do it over and do it over until you get it right. Think about this and put this in your thought process. Make sure that you are, you definitely know that you're going to go through revisions to your process, but make sure that your revisions count and that they're not costing your money, your company more money than actually uh, performing cost-saving measures. And then implement and track. With everything you're going to implement, you're going to track. Maybe it's metrics, uh, percentages, numbers, however you decide that needs to, your processes need to be quantified, it's important that you understand and that everyone understands how you're going to be quantifying the process. And then you're going to do it again. Unfortunately, CQI and, and those lucky individuals that get it right the first time um, really front load. Go into it understanding what the process is going to be, work through, give it a lot of thought, understand how you're going to measure it, and then ultimately you'll get the outcomes that you uh, set out to get. So those times that you will have to do it again, make sure that your changes are going to count, that they're moving you towards uh, a positive direction and that they're moving that needle. So with that, I'm sure that uh, Brian has some questions that he's going to be taking us through. And I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to you, Ryan. Hey, Ryan, before you, uh, before you jump in, I, I, Elsa, I have a question for you. Would you mind maybe just sharing with the participants on the line today an example of when you've applied CQI in your work uh, in medical practices and in hospitals and, and, and kind of, you know, what the problem was and, and what the solution was? And just give us a little flavor for how powerful uh, continuous quality improvement can be. And while Elsa's thinking about that, I just wanted to mention to everyone that, you know, this kind of comes in different 
um, shapes and flavors depending upon the industry that you're in. So in other industries, we call this, of course, Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma. Um, there's always always other types of process improvement um, exercises, but you know, in the medical industry, certainly a, a, the strong words around it are, are continuous quality improvement. So Elsa, can you just give us an example of of uh, where you've seen it in action and the results? Absolutely. Um, you know, I. I and it's a little unfair to CQI is to give it to you in, in, in a very nut and chaw, small nutshell here, but I can definitely give an example. Uh, for um, many years, I ran radiology facilities. And, and if any of you have had an MRI procedure, they can go anywhere from 30 minutes to, you know, well over an hour, depending on what you're having performed. In our case, we were a very, very busy center, and we had to get X amount of patients through the system and still provide quality care and let those patients know that they were important to us. So, yes, you had to, as we used to put it, pump the patients through, but at the same time, they were an individual that had to have a lot of time and attention given to them, especially if we were going to be successful. So what we started is that we needed to uh, decrease the amount of time that we had people in the MRI scanner, the magnet. And, um, and so we set out by stating our objective. We needed to de decrease the time, improve the output. At the same time, we needed to provide quality health care and make each patient feel important. And so we studied the process from the point of uh, entry, from the appointment time, how long did it take an appointment, down to the seconds of a phone call, how many questions were being asked, uh, how much time was given to the answers, getting the patient in registered, how long did it take a patient to get through the registration process, and mapping out all of the steps, even down to the point of how long did it take the average patient to get dressed, the technologist to prep for a procedure, the time that it took to get the patient prepped on the journey for the procedure, into the magnet, the scanning protocols that we performed uh, in order to get the study done, down to our physician's reading time so that we could improve our throughput and get as many patients in and not have a prolonged delay in getting patients into our centers. So ultimately, we improved our time significantly. We improved the quality of the imaging that was being performed on each patient, and our reports were much more concise concise and to the point, and actually we measured that outcome by the physicians that were receiving the report. And they felt that there was a major improvement in even our report. So that's a very, very simple uh, example of how we derive quality outcomes by studying the process, planning, knowing which what the desired outcome is going to be, and then moving through it. We did have, a, have to have a few times where we came in and had to make some improvements, but ultimately we got the desired outcome. And we were able to put about 30 to 35 patients through the magnet in one day. Nice. Thanks, Elsa. I think all of us can definitely... Um uh, res we resonate with that example, and I just wanted to I wanted to, for us to have that in our mind about how powerful that type of um, imp uh, quality improvement process can be for you know for for not only you know the business outcomes as you indicated, but also for the patient outcomes or the customer outcomes. So, thank you for that. 